Welcome back to The Factory. Today we are talking I2C responder devices. I have some addressable LEDs over here. I've got a MicroPython device over here. And somehow over I2C, the MicroPython device is controlling the LEDs. Let's have a look at how you might program an I2C responder device. Also have a brief chat about component sourcing and how I selected this part for the job. Let's get started. Here we have a string of Globit LEDs. These are single wire addressable WS2812B version 5 LEDs. And they're being controlled by the Raspberry Pi Pico. The only connection to the Pico here is this I2C connection. But these aren't I2C LEDs. They use some other asynchronous protocol. And that's where this guy comes in. This device in the middle is a AT Tiny development platform and I'm using it to act as a translator between the I2C bus on the Pico and the asynchronous data that is expected by these LEDs. What this means is that if we bake all of this part of the circuit into a single module, then we can have PicoDev compatible addressable LEDs and other addressable devices. A diagram might help out a little bit here. So here we go. I have on the left side, a MicroPython device. In this case, a Raspberry Pi Pico, but it doesn't matter. It could be a microbit, it could be a Raspberry Pi, whatever. The, this large block, this large blue block on the right represents everything else. So that was the at tiny development platform and the addressable LEDs. We have the four familiar PicoDev connections between the MicroPython device and the module. We have power and ground, and a two wire I squared C bus. That's a synchronous bus. The at tiny on board is serving as the translator, taking messages received over I squared C, doing a little bit of logic, and then passing them out as a separate signal to the addressable LEDs. This means that we can send color and brightness information over I squared C and have the LEDs react exactly as they would if they were wired directly to the MicroPython device. The point here is that there's no wiring required. You just use the standard PicoDev cables to connect everything together and you're done. To get this little proof of concept together, I started by driving just a single LED over I squared C. So all that was re required were three bytes for RGB data and then an extra byte just for say the register to address. Remember, I squared C devices usually have addresses that they expect data to be written to. And so in this case, I'm just writing it to say register one. Once we can drive a single color on that LED, we can sweep it up and down a little bit and just make sure that we can drive it uh, interactively, let's say. And then it's time to start mixing colors. Just brought in a top camera so you can see this a little bit closer. This is exactly as we just saw in that diagram. We have a MicroPython device connecting only by an I squared C bus to some microcontroller, and that microcontroller is driving some number of Globits. So the Raspberry Pi Pico is just sending out streams of binary data for red, green, and blue values for each of these LEDs. So we have in the first LED pure red, just going as a sine wave, then pure green and blue, and then this fourth LED, I've just added the sum of all those together. So we have this kind of rippling wave going down these first three LEDs, and those are matching the three-phase sine wave that you can see on the plotter in Thonny. On the MicroPython side of town for this test, I'm just generating three sine waves, each offset by 60 degrees, so kind of like a three-phase sine for red, green, and blue. And then I'm just adding a little bit of an offset to each to create that nice three-phase pattern that you see in the plotter. Once we have those RGB values, we just create a bytes buffer, which has the first three bytes as just red. That's for the first LED. The second LED is pure green. The third LED is pure blue. And the last LED is some mixture of the three waves. Next, we just push out onto the I squared C bus to the address of our responder device. I've just hard programmed that to some constant and we're writing to register one, which is we just need to write to some location in memory. So for now, I'm just choosing location number one. And then we punch out this buffer of what looks to be 
12 bytes, four, four LEDs, four LEDs, three bytes each. So that's 12 bytes plus one more for the location to start writing them. And the rest of this code is just handling, generating those sine waves. So we increment some variable. So we move to the next step in the sine wave. On the Arduino side of town, we have a receive event. This is called anytime an I squared C transaction is received by the device. And that takes in a argument here, how many, that's just the number of bytes that were received. I believe in Arduino, you get a buffer of about 32 bytes. So that's more than enough for what we need to do here. We set some global variable for how many bytes we received. And then while there are bytes remaining in the buffer, we just read them into our own persistent buffer that gets used by the program. So we just execute wire read into our own buffer, increment the index and we're done. The last thing to do is set some data ready flag so that in our main loop, not inside the uh, interrupt handler, we can just check if data is ready and we check that first byte in the message is equal to uh, one. You might remember from what we're sending, that is the register that we want to write this data to. So we check that we've received at least uh, we've received the right register and that there are 13 bytes total. That will be for uh, four LEDs and that one register byte. Then if all those conditions are met, we just write every buffer value into a spot for each LED. And because we get to set the protocol here, I'm just going to say that each byte is red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue for however many LEDs there are. So the first byte gets used in the red position for the zeroth LED. The next byte gets used in the green position, blue, uh, the third byte in the blue position. And then we just wrap. So now we're on to the fourth byte, fifth byte, sixth byte. I could have done this with loops, but it was just simple to do with some flat code. This block of code is basically just extracting the byte information from our long buffer and just putting each of those bytes where it needs to be for the red, green, blue information for each LED. It's basically deserializing that string of bytes. Now, of course, there's a little way to go for this to be finished, but it's a great proof of concept and it'll give us something to design with. Now, of course, this is a hard programmed example. So the next steps will be to wrap the Python code up into a more general class. At the moment, this is just writing out constant data that I've programmed in. But of course, we want to make this user accessible. So write a class that looks and feels very similar to, say, a NeoPixel library. That way you can just call set pixel color and you can set the, the number of the LED that you, that you want to set and the RGB values. And also to implement other nice functions like setting the global brightness so that you can control the global brightness of every LED regardless of what flat data is written to it. And also maybe some nice like color generation functions like a color wheel or a few pre-programmed patterns. And for the I squared C responder device firmware, this of course is a, a pretty hard programmed example, but it's well on the way to being generalized. Of course, the firmware will be for a specific module with a known number of LEDs, but yeah, it's, it's definitely on its way. Eagle eyed viewers might've picked up that I'm using an at tiny explained 416 development board here. The only gotcha is the 416 doesn't have enough memory to handle the wire library. That's the I squared C interfacing library and the addressable LED library. I've actually transplanted onto this development board an at tiny 816, which has double the flash. But how did I get to this part? Last week I said I'd spend some time in the parametric search and on the microchip website, I found this parametric search page. I have no idea how to get here through the website. I was only able to get to it through a Google search, but there's the URL if you need it. I'm going with 8-bit AVRs because they're cheap and AVRs might have a Arduino core. Super important because we want our device to be, have Arduino libraries for as many peripherals as possible. We need a little bit of flash, so I select eight and up uh, program memory size in kilobytes. An EEPROM would be great, so anything that isn't zero. And a fair few pins. I know that a, a QFN20 package uh, would be pretty desirable. It's a good size for a, for a micro, it's a good size for a PicoDev module. So I'll pick 
just a couple of these options. And that actually narrows us down a fair bit. We definitely want some ADC, so I'll just pick greater than zero for that. DAC would be nice, but not, not exactly essential. It might be a bit hard to get in such a small device. And this list is what remains. Now, this is mostly filled with the at tiny 0, 1, and 2 series. The difference between the 0 and 1 series is not all that large. And I can see here, this is the device that I eventually went for. Just secretly, what I showed you today, it was actually running on an 806. The difference between the 0 and the 1 is not a big deal. So these are, are for our purposes, functionally the same, which is great. As you might be aware, we're in the midst of a global silicon shortage and microcontrollers are no exception. So the choice to go with the 806 or the 816 was definitely impacted a little bit by availability. They're one of the few that we can still get. No hard feelings though, it really is a great device for the task. Let's take a look at it. We'll take a look at the 816 summary. We've got eight kilobytes of flash. It's not enormous, but it's enough for simple devices. This proof of concept, which is not light on, it's using, it's using a fairly large library for the Globits. This is using 50% of the program memory space and 43% of the dynamic memory. We still have 287 bytes available. I kind of feel like that's probably enough. This device is, it's using some pretty heavy libraries and I can't really see a need for too much more than, than what we're using right now. Remember, these are specific I2C devices with very well-defined flight envelopes. So I reckon the resources that we have left should be ample for anything we need them for. Already in the weeds, only on parameter number two. <laughs> with, so we've got eight kilobytes of flash, uh, 20 meg clock heaps. We're probably only gonna, we're probably gonna run that at the eight megahertz internal at most. Uh, 512 RAM, fine. It's got some EEPROM, great. Maybe you want to program in some calibration constants. Maybe you just want a user programmable address. So you could have many, many of the same device on a bus and you would do that by writing address values into the EEPROM. Meets that requirement for being rich with peripheries. So we've got UART, yes, SPI, yes, and of course, hardware R squared C. So that's pr already pretty easy to serve as a bridge between these three interfaces. 20 pin count device, which makes it nice and small to fit on a PicoDev module. And importantly, we have a 12 channel ADC. That is, that's a lot of ADC for such a small device. It is only 10 bits, you know, 12 bits would be nice, but 10 bits, more than acceptable for these custom devices. If you want to read, say, a potentiometer, that'll do just fine. And just an aside, I mentioned the parts shortage. This is the kind of thing we're working with here. We have lead times that go into November 22, November 2022, October 22, 22. Oh, there's, there's a few parts around, but they're not in the right package. So, you know, things, We've, we've managed to secure enough for now, let's say. Thanks for joining me in this deep dive into my little working prototype here. I hope you enjoyed looking at how you might make your own I2C responder and having a bit of a fireside chat about parametric search. Love a parametric search. As always, if you have any suggestions, if you have any questions, do open a thread on the Core Electronics forums. We'd love to see you there. And until next time, thanks for watching.